Okay, so first of all, let's start with the, the notion of white privilege, which has become this buzzword that you hear all the time now. White privilege is responsible for everything up to and including the Kardashians. It's responsible for everything, white privilege. White privilege is a way to silence anybody who is not of color. That's what white privilege is. It is just a leftist bullshit term that means shut up because you are not a member of a minority group, a privileged minority group in the leftist space. It's reverse racism of the highest order. You're basically saying to white people who aren't racist, and you can't find any proof of their racism, that they must be racist because they're white. That is called racism. If you are accusing somebody of something simply because of the color of their skin without any evidence, that's called racism, gang. But you don't have to trust me. We, let, let's go through what, what other people say the definition of white privilege is. You know, folks on the left, what do they say that white privilege is? Well, here's the definition of white privilege from the Southern Poverty Law Center. There's a, a book that I'm sure was just a massive bestseller in its day called White Anti-Racist Activism, A Personal Roadmap. <laughs> and the only person who bought it was the, was the author, Jennifer Holliday's mother. But, this, uh, <laughs> but apparently, her mother works for the Southern Poverty Law Center because here is the definition of white privilege that they quote over at the SPLC. For people who don't know, the SPLC is an extraordinarily far left organization uh, that, that pushes the notion that basically anybody who is conservative and on the right side of the aisle must be a member of a hate group. So here is their definition of white privilege. Quote, white skin privilege is not something that white people necessarily do, create, or enjoy on purpose. Unlike the more overt individual and institutional manifestations of racism, White skin privilege is a transparent preference for whiteness that saturates our society. White skin privilege serves several functions. First, it provides white people with perks that we do not earn and that people of color do not enjoy. Second, it creates real advantages for us. White people are immune to a lot of challenges. And finally, white privilege shapes the world in which we live, the way we navigate and interact with one another and with the world. Okay, when my daughter spits up, she's 22 months old, when, when she spits up, it sounds like this. So let's talk about the let's talk about the perks. <laughs> let's talk about the perks that white privilege supposedly confers upon you. So she says, the, the author here, she says that perks that are conferred upon you by white privilege include things like when you go to the grocery store and you get a band-aid, the band-aid is your skin tone. Seriously, is what she says. Right? The, for, for those who live in the real world, this is also called the free market because most of the people in the country happen to have a lighter shade of skin. And if you want to sell more Band-Aids, then you are going to market to the group of people who buy more Band-Aids. But no, this is white skin privilege. Another example she uses is she says that if you go to a hotel, that the, the hotel shampoo works better with your hair if you're white than if you're black. I don't know how she scientifically tested this, but in any case, this is, again, if, if this is as far as white skin privilege goes, I can tell you nobody should use hotel shampoo because it's gross. <laughs> and then she talks about the real advantages that are conferred upon you by white skin privileges. So what are those advantages? And this is where we really get to the meat of the matter. She says those advantages include skin color, quote, not working against me in terms of how people perceive my financial responsibility, style of dress, public speaking skills, or job performance, as well as people not assuming I got where I am professionally because of my race, and store security personnel or law enforcement officers do not harass me, pull me over, or follow me because of my race. So this is the argument, that America is a deeply racist country that is imbued with this white skin privilege, and that if you are black, you can never overcome this white skin privilege because you live in a deeply racist system that has been created by Western civilization, a Western civilization founded on racism, sexism, and bigotry. So, before, I, I want to go through all of these specifics because I think it's important for people to actually assess whether these things are true in the United States at current. And I don't care about, let, let me put one thing first. I don't care about your feelings. Like, just, just make, be perfectly clear, I, I care nothing about your feelings. I care, I don't want to hear about your feelings. I don't want to hear about your subjective, your subjective emotions. I don't want to hear about your heart cries out. So that I don't care, you're not my wife, you're not my kid, I don't give a damn. Okay, so that being the case, let's actually talk about what is provable and what is not provable and what accusations have been leveraged and which ones are actually supportable. Okay, first of all, statistical disparity does not necessarily mean discrimination. This is the first thing you need to know. Okay, anybody who's ever been in a statistics class knows that this is true. Right, if they still teach statistics and it's not too much of a microaggression. <laughs> so, so, statistical disparity does not always mean a discrimination. Right, the vast majority of people who play in the NBA are black. Very few of them are five foot nine Jews. Right? That is not because there is some sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy to keep five foot nine Jews out of the National Basketball Association. <laughs> I mean, I, 
I, I can't complain that I don't play for the Los Angeles Lakers, right? This is the, because the reality is that in America, it tends to be just as a general principle, meritocracy rules that's true from the NBA to the halls of academia, and it is certainly true on college campuses. Okay, so let's go through some of the accusations that have been made about white skin privilege. So financial responsibility, right? So she, the, this particular author, she said that one of the things that works against you if you're black in the United States is how people perceive your financial responsibility. Okay, first thing to say here, capitalism is colorblind. The only color that capitalism cares about is green. Okay, capitalism seriously doesn't care about your color, it doesn't care about your race, it doesn't care about your sexuality. In fact, capitalism is the single best way to overcome racism and sexism and bigotry and homophobia because if you decide to be any of these things, if you decide to be a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, the guy next door will not and he will take all of that money from you. You will be outcompeted. This is the beautiful thing about capitalism. Your advantage in the marketplace is catering to as many clients as possible and to hiring the best people possible. But the, 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 the usual statistics that are thrown out are statistics about, for example, lenders systemically or systematically rather discriminating against qualified black borrowers. The truth is that if banks routinely did this, they would go bankrupt, of course, because there would be other banks that came in and spend money on black borrowers and those people would pay back their loans and these banks would be able to make a mint off of all of this. In fact, it turns out that according to a University of Iowa sociologist named Sarah Harkness, she did a study just last year, it turns out that lenders actually discriminate against black males and white women for some reason. Or they don't discriminate at all, right? because her statistical size was, was not big enough. But what she came up with was that black, black women were lent to at the same rate as white men in her experiments, which just doesn't make any sense. This is the, so you have to start thinking, is this something that we ought to take seriously or something that we ought to take with a grain of salt. But I will tell you one area in which there was discrimination, and that is the widespread perception that black people were not getting loans led the federal government to create a subprime lending program specifically designated to get people of minority ethnic status into homes they could not afford with bad credit. Okay, if, this had, if it had all been lending discrimination, you would have assumed that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would have been fine. There would have never been a, a subprime mortgage crisis. In 1995, President Clinton's Housing and Urban Development Department agreed to let Fannie and Freddie get affordable housing credit for buying subprime securities, especially particularly with regard to low-income borrowers. So white privilege in the United States extends to the fact that if you, are, if you are not a member of the white privileged class, you have a better shot of getting a subsidized loan from the federal government. And by the way, there are laws on the books in the United States that if you can prove discrimination in lending, you can sue the hell out of these banks. And in fact, banks have had to settle based on historic discrimination. Nothing I'm saying here says discrimination has never existed in America's history. That would be stupid and afactual. But to suggest that it is a continuing factor in American life that is putting people under the boot of the white establishment is just factually nonsense. Okay, style of dress. We talk about white privilege with regards to style of dress. Okay, seriously, this is nonsense. If there, there is no white privilege with regards to style of dress. Because here's the reality. If you sag your pants, if you sag your pants, and somebody says to you, pull up your pants and you're a white guy, nobody says a word. If you sag your pants and you're black, and somebody says to you, pull up your pants, you will be called a racist. Right? This has actually happened. David Stern, if you remember, who was the, the head of the NBA, he was actually, it was implied and, and actually said in many cases that he was racist for suggesting that people in the NBA ought to dress in nice suits. It turned out that everybody eventually took him up on that, and now NBA players are the best dressed people on planet Earth. But the fact is that style of dress is not an aspect of white privilege. Public speaking skills. They say, well, you know, when it comes to the public speaking skills, then white people have an advantage. President Obama is not nearly as articulate as the press would have you believe. Okay, President Obama is not more articulate than John Edwards was, but according to the media, he was the most articulate man who ever lived. He made Jesus look like a piker. President Obama was the greatest speaker in the history of the world. And part of that was because the media gave him affirmative action points. They did. Because if, if anybody said the sort of inarticulate things that President Obama has said routinely when he's off teleprompter, they'd be raked over the coals for it. Job performance, right? They say there's discrimination in job performance, and this is white privilege, right? The fact is that Mizzou has affirmative action in its hiring processes. There are already laws on the books that bar discrimination based on race in hiring. There's already a federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that investigates charges of racism on a routine basis. It has a program. It's called E-Race, the Eradicating Racism and Colorism in Employment. It's designed to fight discrimination against people of color. That is not white privilege. That is the government going out of its way to attempt to fight individual racists and in, in some cases go beyond the evidence in order to demonstrate racism. The idea that, especially on college campuses, 
that black folks on college campuses, people of color on college campuses, are suffering from some unspecified white privilege, really talk to the Asian guy who has to score 230 points above the black guy in order to get in the same college before you tell me about white privilege. Okay, the fact is that affirmative action programs across the country, de facto and, and not de, de facto and, and, and in law as well, all of these programs are specifically created in order to get ethnic minority students with lower SAT scores into the building. Okay, if it's white privilege to, to, sit, to sit on the side because you can't go to college because the black guy took your slot because he had a lower SAT score, and it, it didn't matter that he, that he grew up rich and you grew up poor. Right? If that's white privilege, then nobody would want to be a member of the white privileged class. Racial profiling and crime, this is the one that you hear the most often. Right? The police are out to get black folks. Without evidence, we keep hearing that white officers shoot black people for no reason whatsoever. This is absolute nonsense. More white people in the United States die at the hands of the cops than black people. More importantly, blacks are more likely to be killed by police than white people on a percentage basis, but police are less likely to kill black people in the same circumstances. According to Professor Peter Moskis of John Jay College of Criminal Justice at CUNY, City University of New York, quote, if one adjusts for the racial disparity in the homicide rate, or the rate at which police are feloniously killed, whites are actually more likely to be killed by police than blacks. In other words, if you take a look at the murder rate in the black community, which is significantly higher than the murder rate in the white community, and you use those statistics rather than just general population statistics, what you see is that the cops overrepresent in terms of the number of whites that they kill as opposed to blacks that they kill. How about racial profiling when it comes to speeding? Right, you get this one a lot, driving while black. Well, if you remember back to the 1990s, there was a, a big hubbub, there was a settlement actually from the state of New Jersey in which the state of New Jersey was accused of discriminating against black drivers. Right, black drivers were, were saying that they were being pulled over for no apparent reason. Well, the Department of Justice and the New Jersey Attorney General commissioned a study, and they clocked the speed of all the drivers. Instead of just assuming that everybody drives the same speed regardless of race, which again was an evidenceless proposition, they actually went ahead and they looked at how do people drive in the state of New Jersey. Turns out that black people sped disproportionately. Blacks were 25% of all the people speeding and 23% of all the people getting speeding tickets. Right, so the idea that just because there's a disproportionality that is evidence of racism, it's just not true. How about sentencing disparities? I mean, as long as we're myth-busting all of this, how about sentencing disparities? Right, this idea out there that black people and white people who commit the same crime, they go to, they go to, they go to jail for different periods of time. And particularly, people like to cite the disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentences. Okay, the fact is that the reason that there is a disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentences is because it is easier to distribute crack and it is easier to sell crack and it is easier for people to get high off of crack. And the people who are the moving forces, the moving forces behind the crack powder cocaine disparity were black legislators in inner cities who didn't want people selling crack cocaine in their communities. A majority of black legislators voted in favor of, racial, uh, of disparities in terms of crack versus powder cocaine. As early as 1994, the Justice Department surveyed felony cases in the, in the country's 75 largest urban areas. They found lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than for whites. Actually, uh, the truth is that one of the biggest problems plaguing black communities right now is under-policing, not over-policing. It's not finding people who kill people and putting them in jail. It's not finding serious criminals and putting them in jail. There's a great book called Ghetto Side by a very leftist journalist named Jill Levy. She talks specifically about this. She says that one of the things that is necessary if you want a better, a better lifestyle in inner city black communities is more law enforcement. You need people to feel protected. The reason people aren't investing in Ferguson, Missouri has nothing to do with racism and everything to do with the fact they don't want to have their, their store burned down. If you're worried about the, the property crime rates in an area, you're not going to invest in that area. You want to build up those areas. You need more cops, not less. So stop bashing the cops. Okay, poverty, and the idea is that blacks in America are more impoverished than whites because of systemic racism. Okay, according to the Brookings Institute, which is a very left institute, the Brookings Institute has found that if you want to not be permanently poor in the United States, it's actually very easy. This is a wonderful country. If you don't want to be permanently poor in the United States, you need to do three things. Finish high school, get a job, don't get pregnant before you get married. That's it. It, seriously, if you do those three things, you will not be permanently poor in the United States. Would you like to know why there's a disproportionate poverty rate in the black community? Because there is a disproportionate single motherhood rate and dropout rate in the black community. Okay, as much as you, we can talk about white privilege, the fact is that the single motherhood rate in the black community in 1960 was 20%. Today, it is upward of 70%. Unless you're going to argue that racism in the United States has more than tripled in the same period of time that the civil rights movement had its great successes, this is nonsense. And again, 
There's not a white person anywhere that is forcing a black person to sleep with a black person, conceive a child, and then not get married. It's not happening. It is not, there's not a single place this is happening anywhere in the United States. People, and this is true for, for by the way, white people who are, who are lower, it, it's true across races. It's not just a race specific thing. Poor white people are people who are having kids out of wedlock and not finishing high school and not getting a job, right? It's true for everyone. The fact that it's disproportionate in the black community doesn't mean that whites are racist. It means that something needs to change inside the black community and people need to start taking personal responsibility. I know these words are out of style. Personal responsibility for the stuff that you do. It is your life. Make something of it. So here's the deal with white privilege. Because white privilege always assumes racism without evidence, always assumes racism about, without evidence, when there is no racism, they simply make up the evidence with regard to white privilege. So here at Mizzou, they just make up the evidence of white privilege. They can't find evidence of white privilege. So what they do is they just make it up. Right? They make up stories about how a poop swastika, which I'm Jewish, OK? Swastikas aren't aimed at black people. OK, a poop swastika. <laughs> In, in a bathroom somewhere, this is somehow evidence of a grand racist conspiracy led by Tim Wolf. Right? Okay. I wasn't aware that Tim Wolf scrawls poop swastikas in his spare time. Right? When, it, when, it comes to, when it comes to the when it comes to stories like Jonathan Butler's story about how he was hit by the president's car, he was hit by Tim Wolf's car. If you watch the tape, he was not hit by Tim Wolf's car. There's a thing called video gang, you should use it. Okay, he jumps in front of the car and steps into the car. Okay, he acts like, you, like your kid acts or you used to act when you were a kid and you didn't want to get in trouble for hitting your sibling, so you took your sibling's hand and hit them in the face and said, stop hitting yourself. <laughs> okay, that's what Jonathan Butler did, and then he claimed that he was a victim of systemic racism thanks to this, and then went on a hunger strike, the answer to which should have been, okay, so starve. <laughs> if you don't want to eat... It's a free country, gang, and if you don't want to eat, it's your own damn problem. <laughs> okay, they make up evidence with regard to things like Michael Brown. Okay, we're still hearing that. We, we heard that here on this campus, that the, this whole big movement here sprang from what happened in Ferguson. Never have I ever heard a better example of how bullshit in one place turns into bullshit in another place. Okay, Michael Brown was a bullshit story from the absolute beginning to the absolute end. Eric Holder's racist Department of Justice found that the shooting of Michael Brown was entirely justified. St. Michael of the gentle giantedness was a thug. He was a criminal. He strong arm robbed a convenience store. He punched a cop. He tried to grab the cop's gun. The gun went off. He then tried to charge the cop according to the testimony of black witnesses in Ferguson. That is why the grand jury did not go forward. So, all, but, but again, if you believe in white privilege and you can't find the evidence, then you just make up the evidence. It's really convenient. This is also true, by the way, with regard to the, the grand crusade that surrounded St. Trayvon of the Blessed Hoodie. Right? The fact is that Trayvon Martin was sitting on top of George Zimmerman by witness testimony and physical evidence, sitting on top of him, banging his head into the ground, breaking his nose, and then George Zimmerman shot him. Okay, it's all there. It was all there when, when, they, when they did the trial. But it turned into another instance of racist white Hispanic people because right, George Zimmerman was actually Hispanic, but he is the first white Hispanic in history, just like Barack Obama is our first white black president because he was half black and half white. George Zimmerman turned into a white Hispanic, the only one that has ever been. He's like a, 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 he's an endangered species wandering the plains. <laughs> when you make up your own evidence and when you don't have the evidence to back what you're saying, then we end up in this bizarre space, this bizarre, bizarre space where your own subjective truth is what truly matters. Right, what we hear is, well, I may not have the evidence to back it up. I may not have filed a police report. Right? I may not really know that the KKK is wandering around on Mizzou's campus. Right? I may not know it. I, I don't know, but I feel it in, deep in my bones. I feel like they're reenacting. <laughs> deep in my bones, they're, they're truly and absolutely reenacting Birth of a Nation out there on the quad. That's what they're doing. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be the truth. It just has to be my truth. It's just my truth. OK, folks, there's another name for your truth, and it's bullshit. OK, <laughs> the fact is that there is something called truth, and there is something called not truth. OK, there is no such thing as your truth. If it is your truth and you have no evidence to back it up, it is not the truth. It is your feelings. And as I already said, going back 10 minutes, I don't care about your feelings. Your feelings are unimportant. To mature people, the subjective feelings are, of others are only important if you're married to them. OK, facts don't care about your feelings. So 
Now the, the left collapses to all of this because you know, the left on campus, the administrators, they collapse to all of this because they're on the side of, of a lot of these protesters when it comes to tearing down basic truths about Western civilization. Western civilization to a lot of these administrators uh, who, who cave to all of this. There, there's only two explanations. One is that they're cowards, and the other is that they're on the side of the people who are protesting. Uh, cowardice is definitely a plausible explanation for a lot of these folks because they're not used to being uh, assaulted this way on a rhetorical level. Um, but there is also a good argument to be made that a lot of these college administrators are people who side with this, with this leftist agenda, this world-changing agenda. These were all the people who protested in the 60s and took over the buildings, and now their grandchildren are eating them. And so, and so they're siding with the protesters because they feel like they're part of the movement because every revolution ends up eating the fathers of the revolution. And so this is just the next logical step in the evolution. And, and, and the foundations of the country you know, are bad, and they, they, they agree Western civilization is a net bad. And because Western civilization is a net bad, anything that tears down basic principles, including free speech, including innocence until proven guilty, until basic standards of evidence and fact, including objective truth, all of these things must be torn down. And if the students are willing to do it, then we're willing to help. 